to the refusion, they will stay there for a longer time. So this is something known as activity restriction. So they will spend more, so they won't be able to do normal lizard things like foraging or finding mates or certain reasons and so on. So they will be restricted to the refuge. And due to this, the Nero in its very famous paper predicted that around 20.2% of agamids will go locally extinct and 27% of agamids will go completely extinct. And in this slide, I did my master's research uh, using lab methods and field methods to uh, evaluate the thermal ecology of the spiny tail lizard, also Saramagiri, and its uh, vulnerability to climate warming. The objectives of my study were to understand how this lizard thermoregulates in this harsh I wanted. I also wanted to evaluate the current spin performance, which is a proxy for the fitness of the lizard and how it varies across various temperatures and projected to future scenarios. I wanted to quantify the number of hours for which the lizard is currently restricted to, to its refugia and projected to future scenarios. So I work in the Thar landscape of Rajasthan, which is the hottest part of this lizard's distribution and my study sites were these two plots, one hectare plots, one inside the desert national park and one outside the national park. This is how the two sites look like. I wanted to cover a wide array of landscapes in which these lizards exist, so I chose these two sites which are completely different. Now something about the lizard. The lizard is an obligate burrower. It's a, it's a herbivore which predominantly feeds on grasses. It goes under a hibernation every winter and it's found in the arid and semi-arid regions of India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So a little about the morphology of the lizard which I'll be using in further analysis. So I quantified the morphology for 49 lizard. I measured its mass, snout to vent length, I identified the sex of the lizard, I identified if the female was gravid or not using abdominal palpations and I quantified the body condition index using this formula. This is the mass. This is the SPL of the whole population, this is the SPL of the individual, and this exponent is the slope between log mass and log SPL. So the relationship between log SPL and log mass was very strong, so I only used log SPL for my further analysis. Now, the first question that I wanted to answer was whether the lizard was a thermoregulator or a thermoconformer, and if it was a thermoregulator, how does it thermoregulation varying monthly. To do so, I quantified the body temperature of 19 lizards from March to May. So I attached these eye buttons to the lizard in this cotton harness and marked the lizard with a non-toxic print tip marker and I monitored the individuals between 20 to 61 days. This led me to get around 65,950 body temperature data points across the season. This data was collected at a 15 minute interval and I used skin temperature as a proxy for cold temperature. And I also quantified, so remember this, this is the first thermal variable that I'll be recording which is the voluntary thermal maxima. So consider this as the temperature at which the lizards run back to their burrows. So this is the thermal threshold which is usually used in the field. Then I calculated the operative temperatures. So what are operative temperatures? Imagine you are placing a lizard in the open for 24 hours without any kind of thermoregulation. The temperature that you that will experience in that period of time is the operative temperature in the open. And same for burrows. So if you keep the lizard in the burrow for 24 hours without any kind of thermoregulation, that will be the operative temperature inside the burrows. So to do so, I used these biophysical models, also known as copper models, which were which emulate the size, posture, and the shape of the lizard. And I placed them inside three different micro sorry, three different micro habitats, one in the open, one at the burrow entrance, and one one meter deep inside the burrow. So I used two of these models, one for adult, one for juvenile, and I placed these thermal loggers inside uh, the core of this model. By, and then I used the body temperatures and the operative temperatures to estimate the activity of the lizard. To do so, I constructed two data sets. One was based on observation, this was my test data set. And for observations, I did focal animal sampling in this hide, and I identified the individuals which are already marked using focal animal sampling, and I noted down their activity at that particular time, time from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., 10 days and months spread over the whole month. Then I looked at the daily peaks and troughs 
uh, of body temperature. So these major thrusts and peaks were considered as inactive and active. So this was lizard in the open and this was lizard inside its burrow. Then I created a simple algorithm using if then else uh, algorithm and I saw if the body temperatures, if the body temperatures were nearer to operative temperatures in the open then the lizard was classified as being active and if the body temperatures were nearer to uh, operative temperatures in the burrow then the lizard was classified as being inactive. Okay then for results of this question what I got is that this lizard, Sarah Harviki, is definitely a thermoregulator because the slope between the operator temperature in the open and the body temperature was 0.1, which is minimal. So these lizards are thermoregulating very actively. And this would be the slope if, the, if this lizard were a thermoconformer, which it definitely is not. Then if you look at monthly thermoregulation, these are temperatures in the open and these are the body temperatures. So in March they are somewhat similar, but as you see, uh, as the months progress, there is a significant difference between the two. And the VT max that I talked about uh, turned out to be 46.3 degrees Celsius. So after this temperature, the lizards will run back to their refrigerator because it's too hot for them. Now, this, these are my results from the April algorithm. What I got is the activity was higher in March compared to April and May and the proportion of activity in April and May was almost similar. But if you look at the daily patterns once while, what you will see is the activity is becoming more and more bimodal because the temperatures in the afternoon are too high for the lizard. So in May it's very bimodal whereas in March it's kind of unimodal with lizards being more active in the evening. Other summer limits. So this was what I did in the field. Then I did some experiments to answer some questions which can only be answered in the lab. For that I again captured 20 lizards and I acclimatized them for 24 hours before doing any kind of experiments and they were, all experiments were done within uh, from 7 a.m. I mean from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. which is usually an active period. The first question that I wanted to answer is what are the temperatures that the lizard really likes? To do so, I created this thermal gradient from 25 degrees Celsius to 52 degrees Celsius using an infrared lamp. Then, a lizard was released in the middle of this gradient with a thermal cloacal thermometer attached to it. And then, the lizards were, lizards were free to roam around in the gradient uh, for 3 hours. And the data for last hour, the 25% to 75% interquartile range of that data was considered as the preferred temperature range, which turned out to be 38.2 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. Next question that I wanted to answer is, what is the maximum temperature that these lizards can take without dying? So to do so, I place these lizards inside these metal containers out, uh, and uh, a 150 watt infrared lamp was placed 40 centimeters above the lizards, so as to heat them at a 1 centigrade per minute rate because the rate of heating is also very important. And then I observed the lizards constantly and whenever I observed muscular spasms, I took out the lizards and put them outside to cool. And the temperature at which I observed spasms was denoted as C3 max or the critical thermal maximum which was 49 degrees Celsius which is super high but it's understandable since the lizards are found in these harsh environments. Now, another thing I wanted to look at was the fitness of the lizard. How does the fitness of the lizard vary with different temperatures? For that, I used locomotive performance or sprint performance as a proxy. I also wanted to look at uh, the temperatures at which the speed of the lizard is maximum and also the B95 range, which is the range of temperatures within which we see the optimum temperature or 95% or more of the optimum temperature. So, I took four different body temperatures between 25 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius with approximately 4 degrees Celsius intervals for 20 lizards and I kept the lizard at a desired temperature for, for one hour using a 150 watt infrared lamp to heat the lizard and a water bath with ice packs to cool the lizard. And, uh, when I kept the lizard at the beginning of this race track and uh, these are 50 centimeter intervals and I simulated the lizards so the lizards would run from the start of the race track to the end. This was captured at a 25 frames per second to measure the speed of the lizard. This is what I got. This is a generalized relative mix model 
and from that I got the optimum temperature of the lizard was, which was 39.8 degrees Celsius and the V95 range was this. There was a significant uh, inter-individual variation between the lizards, so that is something to keep with. That in mind. Uh, now let's pull all of those variables together into one simple plot. So this is the V95 range, this is the preferred temperature, this is the voluntary maximum temperature, and this is the critical maximum temperature. This black line you see is the body temperature of the lizard. This is the temperature in the open, this is the temperature at the burrow entrance, and this is the temperature inside the burrow. So as you can see, burrows provide an exceptional buffer to the lizard, thermal buffer to the lizard, as it, the temperatures don't exceed any of the thermal limits. And then, if you see the temperatures in the open, they are varying the most. But if you see the body temperatures, except, so, so the active period is for 13 hours from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And if you see the body temperatures of the lizard, they are, for 11 hours, they are mostly inside the B95 range, where their fitness is maximized. But if you see the temperatures in the open, they are restricted to either burrow entrances or burrows for 6 hours in the open currently. So these, this, this data is basically for May, when the temperatures are the maximum. Now, another question is, will this lizard survive till 2100? And I'll try to answer that. So, let's look at different scenarios. From plus 1.5 degrees Celsius to plus 5 degrees Celsius. And let's look at the worst, I mean, the best case scenario, that is CT max. So, the lizard won't come outside if the temperatures in the open are over CT max. So, if you see, currently it's 6 hours. But in the worst case scenario, and even in the best case scenario, the restriction is 7 hours. So there's one additional hour of restriction. If you see the burrow entrance, in the worst case scenario, you will see there's additional 3 hours of restriction. Right? So they won't be able to survive even at the burrow entrance, and they'll have to stay in the burrow for a very long time. And as you can see, there's no restriction within the burrows, which means that they're very comfortable within the burrows. But we don't need that, right? Because the lizards need to come out to do their daily I mean, to do daily activities such as forage and finding mates and territory defense and so on. Which the lizards won't be able to do for additional hours due to increasing temperatures. Now, I also predicted the decline in locomotive performance across years. What I saw that by 2100, even in the best case scenario, there will be a 2% decline. In, a, in an intermediate case scenario, there will be a 10% decline. And in the best case scenario, then in the worst case scenario, there will be a 28% decline. So a combination of additional hours of activity restriction and decline in locomotive performance will be deadly for the lizards. So the conclusions of this study were this, that the lizard that utilizes burrows to thermoregulate in this harsh environment. Temperature affects both activity pattern and locomotive performance of the lizard. And hours of activity and locomotive performance will decrease with climate warming. And the main takeaway take message from my presentation is that given the current thermoregulatory strategy, this lizard won't be able to mitigate the impacts of projected climate warming. I'd like to thank you. Thank you. So, Richard, for finishing well using time, you can have questions now. Yeah, uh, it's a nice project, sir, and a nice uh, thought to call this uh, hard working. My one question is that most of these reptiles they rely extremely more on behavioral thermodynamics. Okay, so most of the frequency of retreating back to the burrow, right. it may increase because of rising the temperature. Right. So overall, what I personally feel that that component, I don't know whether you are included or not. I that, mean, I mean, the huh, rate so, of Rate of suffering. So that might be much more higher. You know, as soon as they got heated up, they will back to retreat to borrow, right. come back. So somewhere that component is very critical, uh, either behavioral thermography. So that's one component. And most of these animals, they have a tolerance. You know, what we can call the comfort zone or lower or upper critical temperature. Each species has its own, you know, profile, whether mammals have different, reptiles have different. Right, right. So you have to put that factor in your calculation. What is that LCT? As a lower critical, which they can tolerate, and upper critical, they can tolerate. I think I would suggest you. 
But we do not know what is their comfort zone. You know, very, without enhancing the, what I want to make the point, without enhancing any metabolic cost, you know, as the relationship if you increase the DA, metabolic cost increases. Right. So without enhancing the metabolic cost, what comfort zone is like that. Right. So, so that is the main identifier is within which their fitness is maximum. So that's a proxy for the metabolic cost. So that you get the proxy, but somehow you get the literature from the, you know, a lot of, you know, Akhan Barakun and that they have done a lot of all this metabolic pathway. So try to see how sure. that differs from the proxies. So that's the one more component. If you say CT is 49 degree, right. how animals maintain, you know, the temperature or the body metabolic pathways at 49 degrees Celsius? That's See, another they, don't, they die at that temperature, like 49 No, but there's some way they, 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 because there are mechanisms people have reported. Okay. So somehow, you know, what I call is the brain sensitivity. Right. That temperature has been maintained by right. some of the convection and, you know, there are a lot of mechanisms people have reported. So that component also is DC. Sure. So, so these three things try to look for and more behavioral thermoregulation is a particularly semi arid desert and same right. species. The rate of frequency retreating to Baru is varying a lot from a semi arid to the arid right. Just to regulate the body temperature. So that component you have to see in that okay. component. Otherwise, a good predictor, sir. Good use of Thank you. Right, right, right. Especially for the species. I think this was for the species like a 
and uh, so that it's no need to go to the 49 degrees Celsius. Rightly, Dr. Pillar has mentioned uh, his commands. Right, right. They don't go to 49 degrees. Yes. They spend more time inside their weather, which will, in fact, harm the weather in the future. And I try to capture most of the variability in, this, uh, in these three months because they emerge in March, they make in April and May, and the temperatures are the highest in May. And after that, it again declines. So I try to capture most variability in these three months. Okay, good. But uh, my concern is that if you are saying that if it spend more time inside the burrow, uh, that would affect the various uh, characteristics. But it's uh, evolutionary nature. The those reptiles no need to go for higher activity. Most of the time, it has to spend or it has to be in rest uh, to maintain their physiology. So that's what. Right. I want. But the hours for which they restricted will increase. So currently, they, it might be optimal. They might like it. But after a certain point, it might start hampering their physiological uh, needs, like foraging. If they are not able to forage a lot, they might not be able to reproduce and so on. So, something like that. so that will get affected due to increasing temperature. Okay. Great. Anyway, I need more clarification. We can discuss it first. All the best. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Not less. We'll have. Uh, Well, 
where I looked at the impacts of anthropogenic stresses on the social ecological interactions of Karaige and Ongu in the Shivalik Hills. So for my species, Karaige and Ongu sympathetic sector is distributed in the foothills of Himalayas in Nepal, India and Bhutan. The habitat is ranges from moist deciduous forests of Shivalik to the oak forest. The altitudinal range is from 150 meters to 1600 meters. And the species is near the This is the distribution map of uh, the Raike Further, my objective was to uh, examine the activity pattern of the Raike Langur in disturbed and undisturbed habitat, to understand the feeding patterns, and to examine the spatial use pattern of the Raike Langur in the disturbed and undisturbed habitat. For this study, the study area was part of Radhaji National Park in Uttarakhand and Shivali Forest Division of Uttar Pradesh. I use the uh, Raji National Park as a control group without the presence of any human disturbance and symbolic uh, forest division as a disturbed group where uh, local community butchers stay in several small hamlets or deras and the disturbance is in the form of selective blocking, uh, cattle grazing and uh, NDFP collection by the local community. Further. For, the, for this study, I selected four groups of the rival Angus, two in the National Park, D1, uh, UD1 and UD2, and two inside the Shivali Forest Division. The two follows were done from 7 to 5. Six day follow were done to present a session, and the sessions were altered between each treatment. For uh, the disturbed groups, D1 and D2 had a total number of 45 and 41 individuals, and the undisturbed groups, UD1 and UD2, at 34 and 40 individuals respectively. Further, the research questions for my first objective were to see what are the variations in the activity patterns of the right way on group in both the treatments and to see what are the differences in the affiliative and aggressive uh, interactions among the different A6 classes between these two treatments. I, uh, I did uh, instantaneous scan sampling which continued for 5 minutes at max and was repeated after every 10 minutes. And during each scan, the A6 class of every individual was noted down, which was adult male, adult female, sub-adult, juvenile, and infant. And the activity of each individual was also observed. 30 behavior categories were used in this study, and all these categories were grouped into 5 major activities, which were resting, feeding, moving, socializing and others. For affiliative and agonistic interactions, whenever the socialization activity happened, I observed the A6 class of receiver and the actor as well. Allogrouping was used as a surrogate for affiliative interactions and uh, for agonistic interactions, behavior such as chase, display, hand press, face threat and directed, dis uh, directed display were used. For the, for the activity budgets, I, uh, Excel uh, was used to make the activity budgets and the bar graphs represented the variation of uh, proportion of time for each activity. And separate activity budgets were created for both the treatments in winter and spring and for the adult males and other, other females as well. For comparison, GPS of independence was used. For social interaction, Social networking for grooming and agonistic interactions were made, where the nodes represented each A6 class and the edge represented the interaction. So the weighted network, the weighted directed networks were made in art using pattern diagrams. The overall for the overall study, I found a significant difference in the activity pattern of groups inside disturbed and undisturbed habitat, where Groups in disturbed habitat spend less proportion of time in feeding and more proportion of time in uh, sorry, less proportion of time in resting and more proportion of time in feeding and moving, while the groups in undisturbed habitat spend more proportion of time in socializing compared to the disturbed one. It is generally seen that uh, in polymorph primates, where the resource is abundant, the proportion of time spent on resting is more as compared to moving and feeding which can be seen in the undisturbed activity pattern of undisturbed habitat. 
while uh, the groups in disturbed habitat showed an increase in moving and uh, feeding behavior, while reduced nesting behavior, which kind of reflects towards the fact that the resource is a limiting factor in the disturbed habitat. Further, when I compared the active budgets between the two seasons, I did not find any significant difference between the activity budgets in disturbed habitat during winter and spring, and the same goes for undisturbed habitat, where they showed almost similar pattern of resting for both the seasons, feeding, moving, and socializing as well. Further, uh, in disturbed habitat, since uh, even though the resource is available, the abundance of resource increases in spring, but the competition from local community also, also increases, which leads to further uh, loss of available resource for the troops in disturbed habitat in spring and winter both. Further, the activity pattern of adult male and adult females for the disturbed troops D1 and D2, I saw that the adult males in the disturbed habitat spent uh, less proportion of time in resting and socializing compared to adult males compared to adult males in disturbed, uh, undisturbed habitat and the similar pattern was shown by adult females where adult females in disturbed habitat uh, spend less proportion of time in resting and socializing as compared to uh, moving and feeding in uh, disturbed habitat as compared to undisturbed habitat. Further for moving networks, I made the uh, moving network for uh, different A6 classes in disturbed and undisturbed habitat, where the node represented each A6 classes, and it is easily visible that the intensity of grooming interaction was higher in undisturbed habitat as compared to the disturbed habitat, and the majority of differences were seen in the A6 classes of adult female, adult uh, subadult, and between adult male and adult female. This pattern could be because the groups in undisturbed habitat spend more proportion of time in socialization as compared to undisturbed habitat. Further, in agonistic interaction, it was seen that the intensity of agonistic interactions were more for disturbed group compared to undisturbed groups. And the majority of difference was seen in the A6 class of adult male and between adult male and subadult. This pattern could be because of the intra group uh, intra group competition for the resource in disturbed habitat, leading to more aggressive interactions. Further, for my second objective, the research questions were what are the uh, what are the dietary patterns of the algae longboard in disturbed and undisturbed habitat, and what is the impact of dropping on the dietary species in disturbed habitat. For this. Whenever the feeding activity was observed, the species on the part fed on were noted down and it was categorized into eight categories. And in the disturbed habitat, random 10 meter plots were laid in all the feeding patches and the number of trees blocked for every species was counted. Further, the percentage feeding records were calculated, the percentage feeding records and percentage of blocking was calculated. For both, the, for both the treatments using Excel. Now, for feeding, uh, in the total study period, I observed that 41 plant species were consumed with 78 plant parts. In disturbed habitat, 31 species were consumed and in disturbed habitat, 42 species were consumed. 65% of the plant species were common in both the treatments. Well, out of 78 plant parts, 65 were consumed by the troops in disturbed habitat and 49 were consumed by troops in undisturbed habitat. For the species that accounted for more than 60% of the diet in undisturbed were Holophilia, Erisha, Scythesia, Pombi, Sturbilia, Acacia, and Tomilia, Velarica. While the species that accounted for more than 60% of the diet in disturbed habitat were Erisha, Acacia, Sturbilia, Lantana, the Carissa, Dalbergia, and Pombi, Sigma. So, it was observed that the troops in disturbed habitat fed more on uh, fed on more plant parts compared to the troops in undisturbed habitat, which uh, 
which directs towards the fact that the resources are kind of uh, less in disturbed habitat compared to undisturbed habitat. And that can also be seen with the fact that Lantana, being a non-native invasive species, became a part of major part of the diet of fruits in undisturbed habitat. Further, out of the total log trees in the disturbed habitat, 74% of the tree species, 72% of the trees were part of the dietary species in this habitat. And the majority of cropping was observed in terminalia 